coming up. Our God is great. He is great to be praised. church service it's a celebration service every single Sunday and we're celebrating the truths that we just sang but all of that is on the backdrop of that tomb that our every verse started in of that song that tomb that death that curse that's where we were and so we celebrate the Lord's work and what he's done coming down to this earth dying the substitutionary debt a death for our sin debt purchasing us into eternal life with him. And so we just celebrate. We, we lift up shouts of praise to him. But we also ponder that deeply. We think about what he's done. The fact that his blood was enough to cover every single bit of our sin and darkness, every single 
effect of the curse of Adam and Eve that is on us, it is covered, it is never seen again by the eyes of God. That's a ponderous thing. God who knows everything, God who sees everything, does not choose to ever look at your or my sin again if we are in Christ. Micah puts it this way, Micah 7. Says, who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity, passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance, that's us. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love, that's who he is. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. He will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. And this is written in a, an Old Testament voice saying, Lord, we know that you one day will do this, but we are a New Testament people. We look back to what he's done. We said, Lord, you have done this. You have taken my sins as far away from me as they can possibly get and further. You've thrown them into the depths of the sea. Our sin was great. Your love, your sacrifice, your mercy to us is far greater. And so we celebrate this week too. Prepare your hearts to sing. Praise the
you pray with me this morning? We're going we're gonna to pray corporately right now as we pray, so I'm asking you guys to pray with me this morning. And we got some, some big prayers to ask for here. Father, first I'd like to pray for Nick and Martha Freed and the youth, the youth ministry at our church. I just pray that you would bring, bring alongside them an apprentice, a, a family that would love to, to get into uh, youth ministry that would be willing to learn from Nick and Martha and stand beside them and encourage them and, and be able to grow with them. Father, I pray that you would continue to guide Nick and Martha as they lead our youth, uh, that their, their discipleship would be intentional, uh, Lord, and that um, our youth would, would desire to be with them, Lord. Um, Father God, I also want to pray for Wesley Church. Um, they lost... worship director last week, Craig Dibler. And Father, I just pray that you would comfort his family. I pray that you would comfort the church. Father, it was unexpected, so I just pray that, that, that you would hold them in your hands. Hold the community in your hands as Craig was uh, a member of, of the Coryville community for for a long time. And, um, many people know who he is, and I just pray that you would um, just be with the people of the community, and Lord, that ultimately that they would give you praise that he gets to be with you at this point. Father, we just thank you for who you are and what you do, and I just pray that you would be with every single one of us this morning. We love you and praise you in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. As the ushers come forward, we prepare to give this morning. We, we worship through our giving as well. We also acknowledge that it's an act of stewardship. That since that Christy points out for us, we don't give in order to get something back. We get amazing gifts from the Lord in order that we may be generous with them. The entire Christian life is upside down from the world's perspective.
are high above all the heavens and the earth. There's none like you in heaven or on earth. And you deserve the highest place. And we confess, Lord, that in our sin, we, we try to take that place. We confess that our hearts are, are, are bound to this earth. They're focused on ourselves. And though you deserve all praise and honor and glory and majesty to be ascribed to you, we ascribe it to lesser things. And yet you deserve all the more praise. Because even while we were yet sinners, you sent your Son to die for us. Even while we were your enemies, you came to restore us. How marvelous is this love? What kind of mercy is this, Lord? We, we don't know it because we don't have it of ourselves. But you do. And you give it generously. And you give it abundantly. And we praise you for it. We thank you for it. And so, Lord, I pray that in these next moments as we open up your word, I pray that you would cast away from us every desire that is not of you. I pray that you would cause us to, to hate the sin that brings tragedy in our lives. And I pray that you would cause us to love Jesus more and more. Father, I pray if there's anyone here who does not know this Jesus, who has not experienced this mercy that we have just sung about, who cannot say, I ran out of that grave, Lord, I pray that you would bring them out today. Work by the power of your Holy Spirit. We would pray in the name of Jesus. Kids ages first through fifth grade, you can head off to your class. You all didn't hold anything back today. Appreciate that. <laughs> oh. You can open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, uh, it's really important to us uh, that you would have a Bible in your hands, and uh, there are some in the seat backs in front of you. If you don't have a Bible permanently, just make that your own. Uh, we would love for you to just keep that and read it. Uh, encounter the Lord there. We believe that this is God's Word to us. It is true, and it is without error and unfailing. As you're turning to Genesis 3, um, how many of you have ever seen one of those like staircase optical illusions. Ever see one of those? All right, let's look at this one on the screen here. So uh, this 2D version was created by a natural scientist, Heinrich G.F. Schroeder, and it was published in 1858. Uh, it, it's one of those, the original inspirations for the artist M.C. Escher, if you are familiar with him and his uh, perspective reversal. But in 2020, another guy named Kokichi Sugihara created this 3D model of Schroeder's staircase. It, it was voted in 2020 Optical Illusion of the Year. Did you know that there was such a contest? Like, you should be trying out for that, right? But, but it, it kind of really, it really messes with your mind, doesn't it? Like, like it's at the top. Uh, no, it's at the bottom. So weird. So weird. Which, which is up? Which is down? And, and as I thought about Genesis 3 this week, I realized that, that this is exactly what sin does to us, isn't it? You can, you can go on from that now. It, it, it messes with our minds. It, it disorients us. It makes us think that up is down and down is up, that death is life and life is death. And today we're going to discover the, the origin of this sin 
as we continue on in our series, Origin Story, which we're going through the book of Genesis as a church. And as we, as we study Genesis, we are seeking to know who we are by knowing where we came from and the God who created us. That, that's our, our whole vision for the series, to know who we are by knowing where we came from and the God who created us. And we've said that the fun, most fundamental truth about who we are and this is true for every single human being on the face of the planet, is that we are created in the image of God. We are representations and reflections of God. And yet, if we're honest, we don't often do a very good job of representing a God who is holy and perfect and good and righteous and just. In fact, often our lives are the exact opposite of that, right? And why is that? If we're created in the image of God, why do we not look like that? How can we, who were created to be in relationship with God, often look so unlike the one whom we were created to reflect? And how can we get back to a, a more accurate representation of him? The answer to the first question is sin. It's sin. That, that little three-letter word is the root cause of our tragic destruction of the image of God by trying to become like God on our own. It's not some little thing that we do that's bad and we can just kind of make, it up, make up for it with some, some good things. It is the operating center of who we are apart from Christ. Even the good things that we do are, apart from Christ, just ways to try to become God without God. But then we have that second question. How can we return to what we were intended to be? And the answer that the Bible gives is not in the passage that we're studying today. But don't worry, we're going to look ahead in the story. And we're going to discover that God had a plan to restore us from the very beginning. And so here's our big idea for today. Be warned. This is serious. Be warned. Sin appears tantalizing, but brings tragedy only Jesus will triumph. Be warned. Sin appears tantalizing, but brings tragedy. Only Jesus will triumph. Not only you will triumph. Only, not, not figure out, here's some ways to triumph. No, no, no. Only Jesus will triumph. And so your Bibles are open to Genesis chapter 3. We are still very early on in our origin story, but a lot has happened already. God has created everything out of nothing. I'd say that's a lot, right? In Genesis 1.1, nothing that we know in our existence was there until it was. And the Lord formed the earth, and he filled the earth, and he created it with order and beauty and provision. And at the pinnacle of his creation, he created man and woman in his own likeness. They were to represent and reflect his personality and his purposes on the earth. As they filled the earth and subdued the earth, they were to be fruitful and multiply. They were to work it and keep it. They were given dominion over all the beasts of the earth and over all the birds of the air. And God placed man and woman specifically in a place on earth, in a garden, in a place called Eden. It was the place where he would walk with them and where his presence would be experienced most tangibly on the earth. And he filled this place with everything imaginable that they would need to fulfill their calling. There was a, a river that, that flowed in Eden and then overflowed its borders and split into to four rivers 
and filled the earth with good things so that the borders of Eden could be expanded as Adam and Eve obeyed their commission to be fruitful and multiply. And, and the, the end vision of this was that the, the whole earth would be filled with the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the seas. God gave them every tree in the garden for food. Even and especially the tree of life. Except for one tree. One tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was the only restriction that was placed on them. And that became the battleground for their hearts. Today we're going to gather around that tree and see what kind of knowledge it actually brings. Look at Genesis chapter 1. I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any, of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, you may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. So, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and they made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid. Because I was naked, I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman who you gave me, gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me. And I ate. Be warned. Sin appears tantalizing but brings tragedy. Only Jesus will triumph. Like a Schroeder staircase, it, it looks like you were going up when you were really going down. And so today we're going to use this staircase to organize our thoughts a little bit, or perhaps to just see how disorienting the thoughts of sin actually are. And so we're going to start here. Be warned, sin appears tantalizing. It excites our desires. It, it makes promises that it can't keep. And that's the first step that we see in this narrative towards sin. We see a deceiver, a crafty and cunning serpent deceiving the woman. Be warned. Sin appears tantalizing. Satan introduces deception. Satan introduces deception. Now I use the name Satan because that is the name by which we typically know this serpent. In the book of Revelation, the apostle John calls him the dragon. That ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan. John just covers it all. Satan means accuser or adversary. The devil means deceiver. And this is the fallen angel Lucifer who, who led a rebellion against God in the heavenly places. The one who, who tried to take God's place as the supreme being of all things. We don't know exactly when that happened in relationship to this story, but that's another sermon because it's in another text, so I don't got to worry about it today. What we have here 
is Satan embodying a serpent. The most crafty of all the beasts. It's a very appropriate form for him to take, wouldn't you think? We're going to find out that this identification with, with a beast is very, very important. Because the theme of this section is subversion. Subversion. Satan is trying to overturn God's created order. He wants to bring down what is high and put himself in that place. So that's why he goes to Eve. He, he bypasses Adam as the leader of his family. He bypasses Adam as the one to whom God originally gave the commandments in question. And he introduces this little deceptive suggestion to Eve who had heard the command secondhand. Did God really say? He is inserting doubt by, by asking Eve to recall what God said. And he's not even close to accurate in the way that he describes it. He's not even trying here, right? Did God really say that you may not eat of any tree of the garden? And Eve's like, no, no, God didn't say that. But notice in verse 3 what she does when she recalls God's command. She adds to the command. God gave Adam instructions in chapter 1, verse 27. He said, but of the, I'm sorry, 2, two verse 17. I don't know what I got the other one. Chapter 2, 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. But notice what Eve adds. Neither shall you touch it. And then she also subtracts something. She subtracts the urgency. She, she leaves out the part about in the day that you eat of it. And so what is the effect here? She begins to think of God as more restrictive than he really is. And less concerned about obedience than he really is. Satan has her thinking about what she cannot do, rather about what she can do in God's economy. Which is eat of all of the other trees of the garden. Including the tree of life. He has her focused on the prohibition rather than the provision. And that's when Satan drops the big deception. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Here, the deceiver is, is instigating the pride of the woman. That's the second tantalizing step of sin. You see, deception intrigues pride. Deception intrigues pride. You will not surely die. Your eyes will be opened opened, you will be like God. In other words, God is holding out on you. He has something good that he's not given you. He's afraid of what will happen if you eat of this tree. Yes, God has given you the fruit of all the trees in the garden. Yes, you may eat of the tree of life, but this tree, this tree will not only bring life, this tree will bring authority without accountability. You will be like God, and therefore you will have no need for God. Now remember, the, the woman is already like God. She is his image bearer. She has representative authority alongside of Adam over all of the creation. But the promise of Satan's lie is that she can have that authority in her own image. Alongside God, maybe even above God, rather than underneath him. She could have authority without restriction or accountability. That There was a restriction placed upon her. It wasn't a very big one. It did not diminish her quality of life in any way. But it was a restriction nonetheless. It was a reminder that, that she was one under authority. 
It was a test of her faith that God was righteous and good and that he was God and she was not. But the woman wanted to be like God without God. We call that pride. And any time that you see pride, that's what's being evidenced. Elevating yourself to a status where you do not belong. The woman wanted to be autonomous. She wanted full knowledge without fully knowing what full knowledge was. She wanted open eyes to something that she could not yet understand. She wanted, she wanted, she wanted. You see, pride takes what I want and makes it ultimate. Pride ignites desire. Pride ignites desire. That's the third tantalizing step of sin. Deception intrigues our pride and pride ignites our desire. Sin operates at the level of desire. It's it's about what's going on in your heart. It's not so much about what's going on outside of you that's getting into you. It's about what's going on already in your heart. External temptation without internal desire does nothing. It's ineffective. But here is the woman. She, She looks at the fruit. She looks at the fruit. That's important. She sees. We're going to come back to that in a moment. And she sees specifically that it is good for food. It's edible. And it's a delight to the eyes. It's it's appealing. Maybe the Lord is holding out on her. Maybe eating of this tree will make her wise. It is desired to give one insight. It is, after all, called the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Maybe this tree will provide some mysterious, higher-level knowledge that will raise her to the level of God so that she's not so dependent upon Him as His creature. The woman sees, but she doesn't really know what she is seeing yet at all. Because her eyes are not opened. She's making a blind choice based on her own base desires and the deception of the serpent. Now, the desires expressed here are not bad desires in themselves, right? The desire for good food is not a bad desire. Wisdom and understanding, those are good desires. It it is not wrong to want those things, but good desires become God desires when we're willing to sidestep the Lord in order to get them. Good desires become bad desires when they become ruling desires. Good desires become bad desires when they become ruling desires. One of the key distinctions between humans and beasts is that we have moral reasoning to be able to exercise self-control over our desires. We are not slaves We were not slaves prior to the fall to our instincts and our impulses. We must control our desires before our desires control us, which is why this last step is so dangerous. The woman makes a choice to to let her desires rule her instead of the Lord ruling her. That's the, the fourth step of tantalizing sin. Desire impairs discernment. Desire impairs discernment. Discernment is one of the other key features that distinguishes humanity from the beasts. Up until this point, we've we've observed a a number of, of binary distinctions, choices that the Lord has placed in His creation, commands that the Lord has placed in His creation, light and darkness, separate. Sea, dry land, separate. Greater light and lesser light. Creature, creator, male, female, Tree of life, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Life and death. And the Lord gave Adam and Eve a clear choice between life and death. Here is the tree of life. Eat that, you will live. 
Here's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. There are no gimmicks here, no pretense, no tricks. The Lord is simply saying, trust me, trust my word, and live. Reject me. Reject my provision. And die. Remember, who, who gave Adam life to begin with? Who gave Eve life to begin with? Who breathed into his nostrils the breath of life? The Lord himself. This should be an easy choice. But the desire of the woman's heart impaired her discernment. She took the fruit and she ate. Can I suggest to you that this is the most tragic moment in all of human history? It seems so small, so, so benign, but it was cosmic mutiny. It was treason against the Most High God. She wasn't just feeding her hunger with a piece of fruit. She was feeding her desire to take God's place. She was seeking life and wisdom where only death and futility could be found. Understand this. No sin is trivial. No sin is trivial. No sin is small or benign. It is a cancer to our soul. The woman put herself in the place of judge instead of God. And she judged very poorly. The Lord had warned her, but instead of submitting to him, she submitted to herself, and she ultimately submitted herself to the beast, to the serpent. And then she gave some to her husband, who who was with her, and he ate. So only the woman has been mentioned up to this point, but but now we're going to find out that Adam was standing there all along. Why did the serpent talk to the woman when when Adam was right there? I assure you, it was not because women are more open to deception than, than men. And I assure you that it has nothing to do with intelligence or foolishness or any such thing. This is about subversion. Remember, remember God's created order. In the created order, God was above Adam and Eve, and Eve was equal to Adam in value, while in responsibility she was created to be Adam's helper. But as Adam and Eve ate the fruit at the serpent's suggestion, they gave way to a new fallen order. Together they were supposed to have dominion over the earth, especially over the beast, but they they gave way to a new fallen order. Adam gives up his responsibility to lead Eve. He makes no initiative. He takes no steps to protect her from the dragon's schemes. He just stands there like a dope. And together they give up their responsibility to rule and represent and reflect to the serpent. This is discernment at its worst. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sights. Isaiah 5, 20-21. And this is what we do every time we sin. How many times have you and I seen this exact progression play out in our own lives? There's, there's some sort of temptation, some deception, something that, that's, that's appealing to, to our eyes, or it's, it, maybe it's not even external to us. Maybe it's just 
a thought that just comes out of nowhere and, and there's some distortion of what God said, some denial of His goodness. Maybe you just value something more than you value God. We, we now start from this place. So, so it's not hard to get to this kind of upside-down thinking. And in, in your pride, you start to think that you're right. You start to think that you deserve something better than what God has given you, and you, you choose to indulge your desires. In that moment, you choose death over life. Even if you're a believer, you choose to experience that which brings death over that which brings communion with God and life. You call what is darkness light and what is evil good. And you take and you eat what is poison that is sin. How many times do we experience this? Like uh, the last 24 hours for me. Why? Because it appears good. It appears tantalized. What are the ways that you've done this recently? Unleashing your anger? Numbing yourself with entertainment? Indulging in sexual sin? Ignoring the needs of others? And serving your own comfort first? Going about your own plans without even thinking about God. These things look like they will provide some sense of life, some sense of relief, some sense of order, some sense of joy. They appear to satisfy our desires. They look tantalizing, but they bring tragedy. We need to see sin for what it truly is. We need to see how this pattern plays out so that we can turn to the triumph of Jesus instead. Now before we get to the victory part, I want to show you just how tragic the fall really is. Remember shorter staircase, right? What appears to go up is really down. Sin appears tantalizing, but it brings tragedy. Sin appears tantalizing, but it brings tragedy. Be warned, sin brings tragedy. We see the first tragedy in verse 7. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and they made themselves Loincloths. Impaired discernment results in blind shame. So we have this, this impaired discernment, this, this seeing without really seeing, this seeing that the fruit is good for food and a delight to eyes and, and a desire to make one wise, and yet there is this inability to see what brings life and what brings death. And it leads to exactly what the serpent promised. The eyes of both were opened. Now, now, does anybody else find it a little bit surprising that the serpent seems to have told the truth here? And, and does anyone else find it surprising that the result of this sin is described as eyes being opened? Like, that doesn't sound like the way the Bible describes sin ever at all. But this is not the kind of wide-eyed, wonderful experience that they had hoped for. They for sure know evil and good now. But in all truth, they knew that difference before. God said, don't do this, do that. They knew evil from the perspective of what was good before. But now... Their eyes are open to good from the perspective of evil. 
They're standing on the other side of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil experientially. And they're losing sight of all that is good in the process. And their eyes are opened, most of all, to their shame. What, what is the first thing that they see with these open eyes? They, they look down and they're, they're naked. It's like one of those bad dreams. And instead of this being a, a good thing, like it was at the end of chapter 2 where the man and the woman were, were naked and they were not ashamed, now they, they see this as a problem to remedy. They, in their newfound so-called wisdom, they, they sew these fig leaf loincloths to cover their shame. In their self-righteousness, in their pride, they try to come up with ways to get them out, themselves out of the problem that they created. And Adam and Eve's open eyes to experiential evil and shame are really blinded eyes to the goodness and beauty and design of God's creation. All of that fully known and fully loved intimacy that we talked about last week is lost between the man and the woman in an instant because of sin. That which is go was good is now shameful. That which was beautiful is now to be hidden. And they are trying to dig themselves out of a hole and it just keeps getting deeper. Impaired discernment leads to blind shame. And blind shame tends to further impair our discernment. Have you ever experienced this? Like in our pride, we, we so much want to be viewed as righteous and good that we come up with ways to cover over our sin that really only draw attention to the problem. We so much want to be fully loved that we resist being fully known. And we actually think that this is wise. We think that it's wise to be self-protective and self-righteous and isolated and doing what is right in our own eyes. We think that we're getting somewhere with our fig leaf loincloths. And we really just prove that we're blinded by our shame and our prideful efforts to maintain our image. Which leads to this second tragic step down. Blind shame results in fearful hiding. Not only do they try to cover themselves up from each other, they, they try to hide from God. They, they hear the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The Lord seems to expect to be walking with the man and the woman in, in perfect intimacy, in perfect relationship. It seems to be a, a normal practice. This is their, their priestly privilege to walk with God and to, to minister in His presence, but, but instead they're hiding among the trees of the garden. Like a brother and sister who, who did, just did something wrong and they hear their dad coming. Adam says to Eve, here comes the Lord God. We are in so much trouble. Let's hide. Reverential awe has turned to self-preservation and fear. And instead of walking and talking openly with the Lord, they're hiding himself, themselves behind His provision, behind the trees of the garden. What were the trees of the garden? The way that they were going to experience life. They're using his provision of all the trees to distance themselves from him rather than as an opportunity to relate to him. And so the Lord God calls out to Adam, where are you? Now it's not like he didn't know. This is like a parent who gives their child a, a chance to come clean. This is, this is merciful patience. But Adam responds from his hiding place. I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Notice what's not in that confession. There's no mention of the actual sin. Instead, Adam shifts the focus onto his shame. 
Adam would rather focus on the effects of sin with the Lord rather than on the sin itself. You ever do that? You ever talk about the shame and the brokenness and the frailty and the weakness without actually calling sin for what it is? Without actually confessing anything in the process? Without owning anything? The Lord sees through that. But again, He's so patient. He's so patient. Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you to eat? He knew what happened. He knew that these results only come from one source, breaking the commandment that he had clearly given. It's not some magic in the tree or in the fruit that brought about this realization of shame. It is the law of God that is written upon every human heart that we might know good from evil. And when we do evil, our our hearts are designed to realize it. At least at first, until they become callous. But in an effort to maintain our prideful sin, we, we cover and we hide. We know the evil we've done. We we seek a way out other than the Lord. This is the the teenager who slams the computer shut when mom and dad walk in the room. Even if they weren't doing anything wrong at that moment. Just a tendency to hide. This is the gospel community member who is is struggling with a secret sin, but he, he never says anything to anyone for fear that he might be found out. This is the offended sister who's isolating themselves from community all the while growing bitter in heart instead of moving toward God and others in love and forgiveness. In our shame, we tend to run in the opposite direction than we should. We run away from the God from God for fear of losing our life rather than to God because He is the only source of life. We run away from God for fear of wrath rather than running to God because He has promised that when we do, He will give mercy. We run away from God's people for fear of judgment rather than running to God's people because God promised that in the light we will have fellowship with Him and fellowship with one another. And so this is why the Bible says, and this is why God designed it this way, that you should be sure that your sin will find you out. No matter how hard we try, we cannot hide from our Creator. In the end, heaven and earth will flee away and we'll be there on our own. And that will be the judgment day. Which leads to this third step into tragedy. Fearful hiding results in hostile accusation. When hiding no longer works, we, we tend to shift the blame. We, we, uh, Ed Welch says it this way, we, we start firing shots at others behind the trees from which we are taking cover. The man said, the woman who you gave me, she gave me the fruit to the tree and I ate. It's interesting here that the Lord has sought out Adam specifically. Why is that? We've already sort of talked about it. The the serpent went after the woman, but God addresses the man because Adam was charged as the head and the woman as the helper. He was given the responsibility to lead by serving. He is accountable. He neither led nor did he serve. He was simply with her. He was along for the ride. He didn't cultivate or protect. He did not assert his dominion over the beast. He was entirely passive. He simply allowed both of them to be overtaken by desire and and deception. He he just gave in. Men, can I just say this? 
passivity while holding on to some title of leader is not leadership. We are called to take initiative in our homes. The Lord is now holding Adam responsible for the role that he was given. When we get to the curse next week, God is going to deal with Adam last for the very same reason. His curse is the grand finale, and it's because of Adam's sin. We are all in Adam. It's because of Adam's sin that the creation is subjected to futility. But notice how Adam tries to shift the blame in two directions. He he shifts it to the woman and to God. The woman you gave to be with me gave me the fruit, and you, God, gave me the woman. This right here is the ultimate breakdown in relationship. The two beings in the world that Adam was to love most, he just throws right under the bus. What is implied is that in Adam's mind, this is somehow not his fault. And he should not be held responsible. This is the woman's fault. And ultimately, this is God's fault. He is is brazen here. This This is almost psychotic in his thinking. His discernment is totally impaired. And he's doubling down on his judgment that he knows better than God. He's accusing Eve and God for his own sin. And this is what we do, isn't it? Our sin is is never our own fault. Or at least it's not ultimately our fault, or totally our fault. There's situational factors, and and ignorance, and forgetfulness, and trials, and, and we blame others, and we blame God. Recently, I've heard a number of people question why God even allowed sin in the first place. They complained that if if God had never put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil into the garden in the first place, then we'd still be living in paradise. What's wrong with God? But that's the very essence of how sin thinks. Sin thinks it always must be someone else's fault and it must ultimately be God's fault. That there's, there is, listen, there's nothing wrong with God giving a command that he expected Adam and Eve to obey. Nothing wrong with that. It is right and good for the Creator to give commands. For the one in authority to expect something of the subordinate. It's perfectly natural. And God did not trick Adam and Eve into eating of the tree without telling them the consequence. He did not deprive them of anything and give them no other choice. He did not lure Adam and Eve into making, th- in making this tree look better than all the others. He simply gave a command. And it served as a test. A test of faith. A purification, a refinement of their trust and their love. We have no right, no right to blame God for the existence of sin, nor do we have any right to ever get angry at God for the effects of sin. Listen, we can absolutely lament to God. We can cry out to Him and ask Him the hard questions. But that is totally different than getting angry with God and accusing Him. It is not okay to put our God to the test as if we are the authorities and He is the subordinate. Cry out to God for sure. Cry out to God with all of your pain, but do not accuse Him. He is God and we are not. And He rightly gave Adam and Eve a test of discernment. Would they choose life? Or would they give in to the base desires of their heart like the animals do? And they chose to give themselves over to their desires and ultimately over to the beast that is Satan. And that's the last step into tragedy. Hostile accusation results in abdicated dominion and inevitable death. Hostile accusation results in abdicated dominion and inevitable death. The Lord turns the question to Eve and she tries to accuse the serpent. Do we ever do that with our sin? 
It's not my fault. It's Satan's fault. He's really attacking me. It must be outside of me that the problem exists. But in doing so, she actually proves who she is really serving. Remember, remember our little diagram. In, in blame shifting, Eve is saying, I submitted myself to the serpent, to a beast. And Adam is saying, I submitted myself to my wife. And he is saying, and I will sit in judgment over God. They have sub- subverted the created order. And in doing so, they've abdicated their role as the image likeness of God. They've said, I will not be like God. I will be like the serpent, like the deceiver, like the accuser. I will be the adversary of God. Isn't it pretty odd, ironic where, where all of this ends up when the original promise of the serpent is you will be like God? In seeking ultimate dominion, Adam gave up what dominion he had. And he handed it over to Satan. This is the moment when, this, when Satan becomes the prince of the power of the air, by the way. Like Paul describes him in Ephesians chapter 2. He writes, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Isn't that what we just witnessed? That's you. And that's me. Ever since Adam's sin, apart from God, and his gracious intervention, we are under the dominion of the prince of darkness. And that means without Jesus Christ, we are dead. We are dead. We are separated from the life that is found in God. The the promise that went along with eating of the tree was, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And so with that promise, we might expect that by sundown, Adam's breathing his last, right? But instead, death is expressed through a slow rolling curse. The process of death begins that day For man and woman. Eve bears the tremendous pain of childbirth in childbirth. Adam works the ground with great toil, and he eventually will return to the dust of the earth. They they both will be subject to the serpent's poisonous venom, and but they do not immediately die. And why? Well, the only possible reason is mercy. Redemption. That God had a plan through the offspring of the woman to save mankind from their sin. And He still sets before us life and death in Him. We find life by trusting in His word of truth that we call the gospel. And as we consider the warning of Genesis 3 today, we must be sure only Jesus will triumph. Be sure only Jesus will triumph. It can be so easy to preach Genesis 3 and say, look out for all of Satan's tactics and and watch how he he breaks down relationships between God and others. And it it can be so easy to preach that and then say, go do better. Go try harder. And listen, it is good and right to watch out for Satan's schemes. But we do that not by looking at our own wisdom, which we've seen only results in fig leaf loincloths of self-righteousness or of no righteousness at all. We watch out for Satan's schemes by looking to the offspring that God promises in Genesis 3.15, just two verses later. Really, if you, if you study the whole chapter at once, the, the main focal point of the chapter is Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. God had a plan from the very beginning to rescue his people from their sin by sending a victorious conqueror who would 
be born of a woman and who would defeat the serpent. And throughout the story of the rest of the book of Genesis and the story of Israel, God's people again and again and again failed to choose life instead of death. They failed to choose blessing instead of cursing. They stopped looking to the Lord for their salvation and they looked to themselves instead. They worshipped God with their lips, but their hearts were far from Him. And so the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 11, 3-4, he says, But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. He's saying, you Corinthians, you you, you just allow for any old like religious sounding thing to come into your church and and make you feel better about sin. And you, you seek out other ways of salvation. Paul is afraid. He's afraid, he says that the Corinthians will turn to the wisdom of the serpent. To the good-sounding little deceptions that they will stop hearing the true Word of God and be deceived into a different gospel, be deceived into another means of salvation. One where they don't even need saving because their sin isn't really all that bad. And it really isn't their fault. Or one where they... They can serve themselves by the works of the law. And Paul says that would be tragic. That would be tragic because there is only one who has conquered this serpent. Only one deserves our pure devotion. Jesus Christ, who Paul preached in his gospel. Here's the truth of the gospel. That Jesus alone as the offspring of the woman, came to earth with full dominion. He was the perfect God-man. He perfectly discerned life from death because he himself was life eternal. And Jesus yielded his human desires, any human desires that he had, to the divine will, and he went willingly before his accusers with his perfect life. And he did not hold on to all of his divine rights and privileges in pride, but he humbled himself and endured our shame for us. And in paying the penalty for our sin, he mercifully offers eternal life to all who would believe his words and turn from their sin. Jesus won where we lost. He was victorious where we were defeated. And only He will conquer the enemy. Listen, the enemy is stronger than you. He is more crafty than you know what to do with. But He is not stronger than Jesus. And He cannot outwit the author of wisdom Himself. And so once again, just like Adam and Eve, we have the choice of life and death set before us today. Will we choose life by by turning from our sin and turning from our selfish pride and turn to Jesus? Will we trust and obey His Word and find life? Or will we submit ourselves to the serpent find us ourselves on the losing side. Don't be deceived. Don't try to hide or or cover up the shame of your sin. The Lord can see through all of that. Don't try to cover yourself before you come to the Lord. Don't, don't, Don't wait and say, you know what, I need to make myself better I don't know if I can live this Christian life thing. I need to clean myself up and then I can come to Jesus. No, no, no. That's the fig leaf loincloth. Don't do that. Come to Jesus and be clothed in robes of righteousness 
Because that is what he offers through his death and resurrection. Don't shift the blame from your own sin. Confess it. Own it. And then run to the Lord with it. And find grace. Be warned. Sin appears tantalizing. But it brings tragedy. Only Jesus will triumph. Let's pray. Father, we confess that we are sinners in need of grace. We confess that that Adam and Eve's actions are so familiar to us. And so are the results. And so, Lord, we, we turn to you with that. If you've never turned to the Lord with your sin, that right now. And if you have, just pray for those who have it. If you've never turned to Jesus Christ with your sin and received his mercy and forgiveness, then you are dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You are following the prince of the power of the air. You are following Satan himself. say to God, I am a sinner. I have sinned against you in my heart. I've sinned against you with my deeds. I know that I have not done what is right before you. Get specific with the Lord. Don't be general about your sin. Tell him what's wrong with you. Confess that you can't do it on your own. Confess that you can't conquer this enemy. But confess that you believe that Jesus did. That he lived the perfect life that you needed to live but couldn't. That he died the death that you deserved to die. Own it. Believe that you deserve to die that death, but Jesus died it in your place. And that he conquered the enemy that you could not conquer. Satan, sin, and death. Believe that he is the only way. He is the only Savior. He is the only Lord. Tell him, I believe, Lord. Commit to him to walking in that faith, to living in that faith. Lord, I believe that you are Savior and Lord. I need you to help me to live like you are Savior and Lord. Is there, just with every, every head bowed, every eye closed, we don't normally do this. This is not very often in our field. Is there anybody who has, has prayed that prayer in all sincerity for the first time? If not, I would urge you to pray that prayer if you've never done that before. But it's not just a prayer that gets you saved. It's faith in Jesus Christ. That's what we're exp- experiencing through the prayer. For those who, who believe, but the prayer is very similar. <laughs> Lord, I confess that I am a sinner. Lord, I confess that I can't defeat Satan on my own. I need Jesus. I need grace. I need you to empower me by your Holy Spirit 
to choose life instead of death. We get specific about our sins and we talk to Jesus about it and we don't make excuses for it. We don't blame others. We don't accuse God. We say, I need you. I need you to help me to live like you are Savior and Lord. It is only you, Jesus. Only you. I need you to hold me fast. Because my, my faith, my, my grip is insufficient. Lord, I acknowledge that for myself right now. I need you. I need you. Let's sing together. Continue in that state of prayer. thank you for holding us. We thank you that your grip is stronger than ours. Your power is greater. Hold us this week. We trust you because you have promised you will do it. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay.
a seat. Just a couple of announcements for us. Uh, first of all, if you're a guest with us, we are so glad that you're here. And uh, we would love to invite you to just make your way over to the fellowship hall after the service. Uh, just kind of follow your way around uh, the hallway. And in there, you'll find a guest connect table. And you can fill out uh, a connect card there. Um, one of the things that you can do on that connect card is let us know uh, that you would like to attend a Consider Oak Hill luncheon. And this is really just a time when you can get to know the leaders of Oak Hill uh, and you can maybe find out a little bit more about the church. It's pretty informal. Uh, we're, we're just getting to know each other. And, uh, and I think that's an important step in uh, deciding whether you want to make Oak Hill uh, the family of families, the church that, that you, you will call your home. And so... Um, Love to have you. If, if you don't want, if you're not ready to make that step, you can still fill out a Connect card and uh, let us know that you're here. We'd love to interact with you a little bit this week. Uh, you're invited back next Sunday, and uh, we will continue on in Genesis 3 to see the result of all this. Where does all this head? What is, the, what is the fall? What is the curse that we are under, even right now? Um, and and what are we, how are we freed from that curse in Jesus Christ? And so uh, Genesis 3, there is a, a reading plan uh, in, uh, in the fellowship hall if you don't have that, um, and you, we're going to be on Genesis 3, 14, and, and to the end of the chapter uh, next week. Um, Good Friday and Easter are coming up after that, and so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Good Friday, uh, we will be focusing on uh, the, the sin that we are in in Adam, and then the righteousness that we have in Christ, first Adam, second Adam. Uh, on, on Easter, we're going to see uh, the, the body that we are in because of Adam and the body that we will have because of Christ and uh, in the resurrection. And so I'm looking forward to both of those celebrations. And if you guys are singing anything like you sang today, it's going to be a good day. Um, and so I appreciate that. Uh, the Aroma Women's Bible Study is meeting this Thursday. I believe, uh, at 9.30 a.m., and really that is, that is more than a Bible study. They're, they're looking at the importance of prayer, and then they're actually getting about the work of prayer, and, and so uh, it, it's an opportunity for us to uh, interact with other women in the community. It's an opportunity for our women to uh, interact with one another, and so I'd highly encourage, if you're a woman, be there uh, if you're able to at thir on Thursday at 9.30 a.m. Uh, if you need more details about that, please see Amy Williams or Melissa Moeller to get involved. Um, student ministry is today at four, and uh, just a reminder: um, you guys, you students, have a bit of a guest today. Uh, I'll be there, and <laughs> I don't know if that's exciting, but I will be there. Um, and uh, Nick and I are going to be talking about um, really God's design for gender, uh, gender uh, gospel clarity in a gender confused world. And, and so, uh, parents, remember that you are invited to that as well. And uh, we are going to record it as well, because um, I know there, there were a few people who weren't able to come. So we're going to actually do that part in here. Um, but parents, I, I think we're doing some games with you as well. And uh, so come prepared for that. Um, gospel Community Leader Couples Training is today at 11 o'clock. And I just, you know, Gospel Community Leaders, you know who you are. Um, but I also want everybody else to know that they, they do trainings. And, and, and um the apprentices are there as well, so we need some gospel community leader apprentices. If you think that the Lord might be calling you in that direction, uh, we would just talk to your gospel community leader about that. Um, but every, everybody who is not a part of this training is, is welcome to stay in the fellowship hall just, just for uh, until about 11 o'clock, and then we're going to have to change that room over. Um, but please stay and get some coffee, and I don't know if there's cookies over there or not. But uh, in that, know that you are loved. Have a great day in the Lord. Thank you.